Hello guys, how are you? I'm Hadeep Singh. Welcome back to your own YouTube channel. IELTS updates and recent exams. For more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing test topics, listening, reading, practice test, and speaking, you can just work. Please guys, participate in everyday listening and reading practice test to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page IELTS updates and recent exams. Part 1 You will hear a conversation between Peter and Jim talking about some details for their shared accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Hey Jim, it's Peter. Oh hey Peter, what's up? I thought I'd call so we could hammer out the details for next year's lease. That's a good idea. Did we ever decide on how to split the total rent? Well, I was thinking since my room is bigger, I probably should pay a little more. So I could pay £110 and you could pay £80. Does that sound okay? Considering that my old apartment cost me £100 for a smaller room, I'm definitely all right with that. Hey, I was looking at a map of the area and can't seem to find a bus stop near it. Do you know where we would catch the bus? Well, the bus is actually pretty far from us, but we have that garage that we can park our cars in. Wow, that's great. Convenient parking is hard to find, so we're lucky we have that. OK, so we have a whole lot of things we'll need to buy when we move in. How do you want to split that up? I was wondering, do you still work at the supermarket? Yep, every Tuesday and Saturday. Would you be able to buy things from there if I sent you a shopping list? Sure, I can do that. Great, then I can take care of whatever else we need that you wouldn't get at a supermarket. If you want, I'll pick you up from work that day and we can go to the apartment together. Oh, that would be great, thanks. No problem. That way we can split the cost of petrol. Works for me. It's so expensive these days, isn't it? It's downright obscene. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. So let's figure out what appliances we need. Do we have a microwave? Yes, the landlord's providing that for us. Hey, do you still have that space heater, though? We need one for the kitchen since it's not connected to the central heating. All oh, right, I'll bring that. Anything else? Well, I have some dining room and living room furniture I can bring, so that should take care of most of the big stuff. You know what we do need, though? Could you bring a toaster? I actually don't have one. It doesn't come with the microwave. No, the landlord is only supplying the microwave. It would really help if you could bring one. OK, I'll pick one up at the store. You know, I also have this cool antique rotary phone that would be a cool addition to the apartment, sort of as decoration and utility. Oh, cool. The only thing is, we'd have to put it in the kitchen unless you want it in your room. Why not put it in the living room? The living room's too loud to have a phone conversation. The noise sort of carries. So if one person is trying to watch TV or have friends over, the person on the phone won't be able to hear. Hmm. OK. Well, I guess kitchen it is then. Any other big things we need? That seems like everything. That's all I can think of. And of course, move-in is... June the 1st. 
I can't wait. We'll be able to watch the big game in our new apartment. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, we can move in in the morning, and then Friday night we can sit back and cheer on Liverpool. I have an exam in the morning, but we'll be done around 11 a.m. and can move in after. Wait, Liverpool? You're joking, right? I thought you were a Manchester United fan. Man, you? No way. Liverpool all the way. Oh no, I, I don't know if I can live with a Liverpool fan. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You'll hear an HR representative of Earn and Learn giving some information about her company. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Welcome to all of you. Can everybody see and hear me? Good. I'm Sarah Connor, an HR representative of Earn and Learn. I have been asked today to talk to you about our company. So, for those of you who don't know very much about the company, let me start by giving you some basic information about it. Earn and Learn started nearly 20 years ago. It is not a charity, but a for profit company that enables promising entrepreneurs to make money while traveling. During the past 10 years, it has grown rapidly and has gained great influence in most countries of the world. We have a partnership with the school and take a large number of recent graduates from the business school. So if you are a recent graduate, I'd say you can consider applying to our company. Before your application, you might be curious about what sort of places you could go to. There are four main locations, but you also have the freedom to submit a different location, and if they can make the necessary arrangements, you can go. The first country Earn and Learn established locations was the US, where you may choose from multiple locations, as long as you can commit to their more rigid schedule of August to December. Also, you could do the Australia internship. That one is really cool. You work at a wildlife shelter and learn about the business practices of non-profit organizations. You do have to be willing to commit eight months for that one, though. Perhaps that's a long time to be so far away, but I would say it is really an amazing opportunity. I don't know whether some of you are in decent physical shape. If so, the South Africa internship is another exciting one. You learn a lot about sustainable farming, but you would be doing some of the manual labour involved in maintaining a farm. Indeed, it's hard work, but I think you would definitely be able to do it. It may be wise to wait until after their summer is over, so it's not so terribly hot. In addition, there is a most recently established location in India. This one gives you more of a study abroad feel, given that they arrange a host family for you to stay with. In the other locations, you live in an apartment with other interns, so this is definitely a unique experience. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Regardless of where you go, at the end of the program you get a global travelling certificate, 
as long as you can explain your experience. You can provide a written log of what you did. I recommend writing journal or blog entries about what you do every day, or a weekly summary of each day. Of course, you don't have to write up a formal report or anything like that, and you need to apply for it once you have returned. Some students may want to know whether this is a paid internship. Actually, you have to pay for the flight there yourself. But you have the opportunity to create your own small business, which could earn you money if it's successful. So basically, you pay for it all up front, but when you're there, you can find ways to make money. That is to say, you pay for two thirds of the cost up front as a deposit, and then give the final instalment one month prior to your return. Finally, I have to remind you that you need a health check before you go to make sure you're not going to spread any communicable diseases. In addition, before you go, you don't have to attend any meetings or workshops. You'll meet everyone you'll be working with once you get there. OK. Well, that's all I've time for today. Thanks for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear a student, Eric, talking to his lecturer, Mrs. Harris, about some study difficulties. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Hi, Mrs. Harris. I really liked your lecture, by the way. Oh, thank you. Glad it was interesting. So, how can I help you? Well, why do you think I need help? You just don't look too happy. I admit I'm having some difficulties. About what? Oh, it's hard to say exactly. All the reading is quite a chore, but I'm handling it. What really wears me down are the assignments. The reading load is just part of the course, but sure, the assignments take more time, more effort. And you know how you have to use what you read in your assignments? That's right. That's the point of the readings. Well, the reading passages also seem, well... Boring? No, not boring, but it's hard to connect it all, to remember what the readings are about, if you know what I mean. Well, I'd advise you to write a small summary at the back of each reading text. Really? Absolutely. Basically, you don't want to be going through these texts again and again, and you'll need to refer to them often. So, write a small summary, and when you revisit these texts, just read these. I'm not too sure how to write a summary, though. It's easy enough. The important thing is to check that you've written the main point and not just a list of details in order of their appearance. Details are not what matters, so again, don't make a list of these. That will just waste valuable time and you're going to get very busy soon enough. Usually these articles argue a point or otherwise have a certain purpose. So think all the time, what's the point and what's the purpose? Okay and just write that? Not just that. You have to think about the supporting points also. Then you might wish to cite some evidence. You can decide that yourself. But what's the most important thing about a summary? That it's accurate? No, that it's short. After all, it's a summary, right? So, main point, supporting point, some evidence, and most importantly, keep it short, OK? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Well, those points about writing summaries sound useful, but what about the actual formatting of the summary, on paper I mean? Are there any other points I should know about? Yes, there's a lot actually. It's very important to... Write clearly? Write the author's name. But the author's name is in the text anyway. But it must also be in your summary. And you must always lead with this. For example, Peter Brown argues that, and so on. So the author's name is Peter Brown? Yes, and the actual summary continues from there. And here's another good hint. Always write the citation details at the top using bullet points. This makes these details clearer and easier to see, and immediately means you're not plagiarising the text. You are acknowledging the source, which is academic and required. This also allows you to quickly write these details down later, if you paraphrase or quote from either the summary or the original text. What details go in the citation? The year of publication is obviously important, but here's another tip. Make sure whatever you're reading is not more than 10 years old. Anything older than that is considered too dated, since business theory moves on fairly quickly. You can cite older texts, but only under special conditions. What are they? Well, if the text is a very well-known book, a classic of its kind, but then you have to indicate that in your writing, acknowledge that the book is dated, but then give a justification about why you nevertheless felt the need to use it. I see. So, you'll have a lot of summaries for all the texts, but with such clear formatting you'll be able to access information quickly. But make sure you store these pages in an order, of course. Alphabetical, based on the author's family names, is the simplest method. Or in order of date, chronological order. That's possible too but I'd say alphabetical is always the best. My friends say chronological order has more advantages. Any system is fine, provided that it's logical and that you can follow it and quickly access your summaries at a later date. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. You will hear a lecturer discussing the marketing and consumption of kangaroo meat. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. When one thinks of Australia, one of the first images that comes to mind is of the kangaroo. This native marsupial is cute, unusual, and with the baby kangaroo, known as a joey, safely in its mother's pouch, it presents an enduring image often seen on Australian postcards and posters. Yet these animals breed prolifically and have been highly favoured by the widespread clearing of forest and bushland in the past to provide land for the traditional sheep and cattle industry. Ironically, kangaroos breed in such numbers, up to 50 million per year generally, that they have become pests. Consequently, for a long time now, there has been a yearly cull. In other words, their numbers are reduced with controlled and accurate shooting. And here we are talking of shooting millions of them. In the past, the carcasses were simply left out in the bush. Then later, some of the meat was used as cat food, and still is, in fact. It is only in recent years that the meat has been used for human consumption, primarily for the overseas market, and one can see why. The meat is, by all accounts, leaner and tenderer than beef. 
It has a strong taste and minces easily, but it also has some more subtle advantages, and this is a topic I'd like to explore now. Now, there is a market, small but growing, for kangaroo meat. And one interesting reason to encourage its consumption is that it is environmentally friendly to do so. And this itself is for three reasons. One, the traditional cattle and sheep, which mostly fill the rural pastures of Australia, are introduced species and somewhat destructive to the environment. After all, they weren't meant to be there in the first place. Their eating habits destroy the root systems of grass, their hard hooves tear open the ground, and their droppings are heavy and smothering to new growth. Kangaroos, in contrast, have all the opposite traits. They are a native animal existing in harmony with the natural environment there, so replacing cattle with kangaroos makes good sense. The other benefit is that, unlike cows and sheep, Kangaroos don't produce methane as a byproduct of their digestion. And methane, along with carbon dioxide, is one of the primary agents of global warming. Finally, since there are too many kangaroos anyway, culling their population for their meat increases the biodiversity of Australia's wildlife. In other words, wallabies, quokkas, wombats and other native animals are given space to increase their numbers also, in the way that it was meant to be before the bushland was extensively cleared. So, one would think such arguments make the case irrefutable. However, there are some serious issues to overcome. The biggest problem is the way eating this meat is perceived. Many people still feel uneasy about eating what is, in effect, a national symbol, and a cute one at that. As well as this perception problem, kangaroos cannot be domesticated or raised within enclosures, as can conventional cattle. Kangaroos simply leap over fences, meaning that it is wild kangaroos that are harvested, which is not always efficient or cost-effective. This process involves trucks, shooters, spotlights, and many people to assist in transporting carcasses from remote locations. Finally, the public are not that happy with guns being the tool to cull these animals, arguing that it is inhumane. Professional shooters are, of course, trained, licensed, and follow a strict code of practice. They use accurate weapons and always aim for the head. The kill, in theory, is instantaneous, yet not necessarily in all cases. Thus, videos of kangaroo shooting taken by animal rights activists can cause great problems for the industry. Yet, what the public needs to realise is that, ultimately, all of their meat requires the killing of animals. And what happens in cattle abattoirs is, in essence, no different to what happens during the average kangaroo cull. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing us topics, listening, reading, practice test and speaking you got guesswork. Please guys participate in every day new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired dance score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material, visit my official website www.ielsupdatesandrecentexams.com The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material, then please join my Telegram channel. So guys, please write your score below the comment section. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.